drink. Testament Theology, our second lecture. Today we're going to be talking about Christology and Incarnation. I put the Incarnation in there just sort of to give you a clue, because Christology may not be a word that you're very uh, accustomed to. It's pretty straightforward in terms of what you mean if you parse it. Parse means to take it apart and figure out the pieces. Um, Christology and Incarnation today, and then the rest of the schedule you have. Let me give you first a definition to get us started on what is Christology. Christology, a definition would be the study of the person, nature, and work of Jesus Christ, especially as reflected in the New Testament. So Christology is the study of Jesus. And that sounds so obvious, but it is one. it has been one of the most difficult areas of study within theology. It's a branch of theology. But it's, um, it's one, and I'm going to talk a little bit later, I'm going to take a fairly historical approach to this today simply because the development of our modern Christological theology um, is really did develop over time. And it came out of people making mistakes and then having to work through what was wrong with that, etc. We're going to get into that, but I want to give you a little bit more definition here. We can also say that Christology is particularly concerned with the relationship of the nature and person of Jesus with God the Father. So how does the nature and person of Jesus relate to the nature and person of God the Father? And it's concerned with details of Jesus' ministry, his acts and teaching, so that we can arrive at a clearer understanding of who he is and how it is that he is able to provide us our salvation. Okay? Christology has to do with the person, nature, and work of Jesus, especially how do we understand that in relationship to the person and nature of God the Father, and how does all that work with regard to how we are saved because of Jesus' nature. It's because of who he was that we are saved. Um, we might say, a blunt way to put it is, how is it that Jesus was both human and divine, and how is that important for our salvation? That's the lay version. Okay. I talk about, um, I mentioned the, the idea of who he is, the nature of Jesus, is critical. I was in a, an Episcopal church, a large Episcopal church, All Saints Episcopal in Pasadena, California. Uh, I attended there when I was in seminary in Fuller because it was right next door. I was not a Presbyterian at that time, by the way. And I went, I was leading a class. I was asked, since I was a seminary student, to lead a Bible study class. The rector, rector is the name for the senior pastor or the minister at a, an Episcopal church. Um, unless if he's visiting, he's called a vicar, but he's the regular guy, he's the rector. Well, the rector uh, was very famous. His name was George Regas. He was really famous. He's one of the, the most senior rectors or ministers in the Episcopal Church of the United States at that time. And he was horrendously liberal. Not to put too, good fun, not to put too fine a point on it. Um, they fairly regularly would have Buddhist monks give the sermon for the day and all kinds of stuff. And I don't have anything against Buddhist monks, but that's not what we were there for. <laughs> okay. um, well, George Regas preached a sermon one time, and the title of the sermon was, What Does It Mean to Be a Christian? Which was very much the topic we were dealing with in the, in the Bible study. It was more a small group kind of study. We were look, using a book called Experiences of God by Jürgen Moltmann, which is a really good book. Not Boltmann, not Boltmann, Rudolf Boltmann, you've been reading about him. Jurgen Boltmann, different guy. <laughs> okay. Well, this sermon, what does it mean to be a Christian? And, um, and George preached on that, and his sermon was, to be a Christian means to go where Jesus went and do what he did. And where he went was to the poor, and what he did was minister to them. So to be a Christian means to go to the poor and minister to them. Well, there were several... Several people have a very liberal orientation, and, and I was, God gave me the grace to be patient with them. I mean, I was not banging them upside of the head with a rolled up King James or anything like that. Uh, but I was trying to lead them to a rational, to a, to a sensible understanding of a more orthodox uh, belief. Well, after he preached that sermon, I had one person come up to me during the coffee hour and get right in my face and say, well, what do you think about that? <laughs> and I said, well, we'll talk about it on Tuesday night. So when we got together, I said, with, with all due respect to George Regas, I, I disagree with him. I think the point about Jesus is not where he went. It is not even what he did, although that's important. The real point is who he was. That's the difference. 
Christology is the study of who he was. There have been many God compassionate, even godly people down through history who have cared for the needs of the poor, who have shown compassion, who have been sacrificial in that, who were not the Messiah because they didn't have the credentials based on who they were to save us. And so Christology is the study of how it is, what is the nature of Jesus with regard to his divinity and his humanity, and how is that critical for our salvation? Okay? Fair? You know what Christology is now. Okay. Uh, now, it's true also that this biblical understanding of who Jesus is, is the most crucial aspect to our salvation. It is the thing that saves us. You can, you can be able to quote every scripture with regard to Jesus' actions, all of, the, uh, all of the narrative about Jesus. You can even quote the discourses. But if you don't have a concept of who he was, if you've not accepted, Romans 10 says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. If that is the fundamental confession. You've heard me mention that, in, I think, in this class. Jesus is Lord is the foundational confession of the Christian faith. Well, Jesus is Lord is a Christological statement. It is a definition of who he is. And by that we are saved. Okay. Now, cults and world religions, world round, will say they believe in Jesus. But the problem is that they don't believe in Jesus as he is presented as Lord in the New Testament. Which is why our Christology is so important that we are clear and we are able to articulate what the nature of Jesus is, contrary to some of the other descriptions people have of him. I mean, um, if you talk to Christian scientists, if you talk to Mormons, if you talk to any number of people out there, they would say, oh yes, I believe in Jesus. Well, if you dig down, you will find that their conception of Jesus is not the New Testament, the biblical conception of Jesus. Um, the Mormon faith, for instance, they're called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I'm not trying to pick on them, but you need to understand their differences here. Um, they would say, yes, I, we believe Jesus, and we believe he was divine. They don't, but if you dig down about what they believe about Jesus, it's, it's not the New Testament belief. And they would say, Jesus was divine in the way that I can be divine. <coughs> that I can be my own God. And that I, if, I'm, if, I'm really, if I really work at it, do the right things, then I can have my own kingdom to be divine over. All right? That's not the New Testament. So our Christology, what we believe about Jesus who was fully God and fully man, how it is that he, uh, by his death, paid for our sins, is <coughs> the most important and foundational aspect of Christian theology. Okay? That's why we're starting with it. That and the fact that it's primarily based in the Gospels, not entirely, because Paul and others uh, relate to that. But Christology is the fundamental, the most fundamental of all theological pursuits for the sake of our Christian faith. Okay? Now, something I've already said is the, the real issue, the thing that people have always struggled with, how can you be human, really human, and divine, God, at the same time? We have gotten that wrong, we being the church, in every possible permutation. And then sometimes we've doubled back and gotten it wrong the same way again, down through the history of it. But the thing we have to recognize, I want to start with the understanding that Scripture is very clear in describing Jesus as being both God incarnate, both divine, and also human. That's the God incarnate part. So I want to look at a couple of, of things here. Um, Jesus is clearly identified as God incarnate in the New Testament, especially in the Gospels. Mark 1.1 1, 1 says that this is a record of the Son of God. And then he goes on into the genealogy. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then verse 14 says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have known his glory. Um, the Galatians, 1 John 1, all talk about him being the incarnate God. The fact that Jesus was miraculously born of a virgin, Matthew 1.22, uh, the declaration to Mary that she says, how am I going to have a baby if I'm a virgin? And they said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, what you bear will be of God, and it will be in fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah that a virgin will... will uh, uh, 
will conceive, and I started, I was trying to figure out the, the, best, <laughs> the best way to say that, because there's several different translations of it, will conceive and bear a son, um, and he, his name will be Emmanuel. Uh, Luke says the same thing. We also have uh, Jesus as divine creator. Again, back to the first chapter of John. John says, um, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was with God in the beginning. And then it goes on to say, through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. Uh, Colossians 1.16 says that he was the creator of all that is. Hebrews 2 says the same thing. Uh, Jesus also is identified clearly as Lord. That Romans 10.9 that I quoted a minute ago. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. And we're going to talk about that, that Lord reference, which is Kyrios in the Greek, in a few minutes. Um, Philippians 2, 9 and 10, and even though he was himself equal with God, he did not count his divinity something to be grasped. This is the great kenosis passage it's called, but rather set it aside for our sakes. Um, so, and, and Hebrews 1, 3, you guys can look those up. I didn't want to spend a lot of time dwelling on those. But Jesus is clearly, throughout the whole New Testament, identified as something more than just a person. He is God incarnate. He is, he, we're going to talk about the, the Son of God uh, title again in a few minutes. But Jesus, at the same time, is represented as human. For instance, all the way through the Gospels, Jesus is described as showing human emotion. He it talks about his love. John 13, 1 says, it was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave his world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. He loved the people around him, the people in his life. He also showed compassion, human emotion. Matthew 9, 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Like sheep without a shepherd, they were harassed and helpless. Uh, he also showed anger. You know, this, the whole concept of uh, gentle Jesus, sweet and mild, is a really bad picture when you read the Jesus that was in the that is in the, the New Testament Gospels. He was a, a man of strength. He grew up as a carpenter, a man working with his hands. Um, he lived outside <laughs> through his own ministry. I mean, they camped. Uh, he was a man's man, and he got mad about stuff. John two says so. He made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? And he showed grief. Jesus wept. He, he grieved over the fact that Lazarus died, his friend and the brother of uh, Mary and Martha. Now, he didn't grieve because Lazarus was dead. He, he grieved because Lazarus and his family had to experience death. Death was not part of God's original plan. And yet death exists. And the grief and the pain that comes with that, I believe, is what Jesus grieved over, what he wept over. Because he raises Lazarus from the dead just a few minutes later. Okay. It's also true that Jesus is described as having physical, that is, human physical characteristics. He gets tired. Um, it says he sat down by the well. It was the sixth hour because he was tired from his journey. He slept. Remember, he was so tired, he falls asleep in the back of a boat when they're crossing the Sea of Galilee. And a storm comes up there. But Wake him up. He says, what is your problem, you ye little faith? But he was so tired that he falls asleep in the back of the boat and doesn't wake up even when the storm comes up. He's uh, described as hungry in Luke 4 when he's being tempted in the wilderness. He ate nothing during these days, and at the end of them he was hungry. He is thirsty, um, later knowing that all was completed so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Jesus said, I am thirsty, and he experienced pain and death. You know, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a, a spear, brought forth a flow of blood and water. Jesus knew what it was to experience pain and death, real physical death. So Jesus was fully human, and that's given to us clearly throughout Scripture. So we have the deity of Christ, that he was God, and the humanity of Christ, that he was born like everybody else is born, he lived, he experienced all the physical parts of being human that we have. He died, and then later was resurrected. Okay. So I want to now talk about a little bit about some of the titles that we find in Scripture that are specific to Jesus' uh, particular, the Christology, his particular nature. The first one is um, Christ or Messiah. I've told you before, that's the same word. Christ is Greek, Messiah is Hebrew. Both of them mean the anointed one. 
John Calvin did a lot of work on what's called the, the uh, triune character of the Christ, which means he was uh, both prophet and priest and king. Now, in the Old Testament, kings were always anointed, but we have other examples where both prophets and priests were anointed. So by being the anointed one, Jesus is both representative of and also fulfilled the, the activities of prophet, priest, and king for us. Um, and it's always been interesting to me, we, we, a slight difference on that, that sort of threefold function. The three most important characters in Jewish history were Father Abraham, you know, the one that was their, in effect their creator. It was from him that all of the Jewish people descended. So he really was their father and creator in terms of his seed was the start of the whole people. <clears throat> you then had Moses who really was the founder of the Jewish religion by God. I mean, God gave him that instruction, but he was the one who brought the faith to them. Uh, the one who was the, the leader, the, actually the redeemer even. He brought them up out of the land of Egypt. He redeemed them and gave them their faith. And then thirdly, King David. So you've got father, you've got redeemer, you've got king in the three most important characters in the Old Testament. And when the Jews were looking for a Messiah, they were looking for somebody who could be all of that. And there's only one, one individual who's ever come along that could be Father, remember he's the Creator. All things were made through him, without him nothing was made that has been made, John 1. He was the Redeemer, clearly. He sacrificed himself for our sins. And then thirdly, he was the King, the Great King. And we will experience that kingship especially when he comes again. So much of the nature and person of Jesus, much of our Christology has to start with the expectation that the Jewish people had for the Messiah. Now, throughout the Old Testament, the promise had been given throughout that there would come one who was anointed by God, who was sent by God, who would be the, um, the new king. He would be of the line of David. He would be the one that would free the people from their oppression the one that would lead them into righteousness. This was the image of the Messiah. And so that image of the Messiah, not only is Old Testament, the expectation that God would send someone to free them from oppression had been so fundamental to the Jewish beliefs, that gets carried over to the New Testament. You have, we have to be aware that Luke is the only writer of the New Testament who was a Gentile, who wasn't Jewish, who did not come out of the whole ethos of expecting that God was going to fulfill his promise that he made throughout the Old Testament, most especially to David, that he would send a new redeemer and leader who would be the Messiah. That gets reiterated, and if you know that about the Jewish people, then you read certain passages with that particular understanding. For instance, the passage here, uh, Matthew 16, 15 and 16, this is the place where Jesus asks uh, the disciples, well, who, do people, who are other people saying that I am? And they say, well, some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist come back, you know, different people say different things. And he said, well, um, and he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the anointed one, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, uh, because it's not by any, any earthly force, but it is from God himself that you have that understanding. <coughs> So, Matthew, probably one of the most Jewish of all of the New Testament writers, was the one uh, who records Peter's declaration that you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, Mashiach in Hebrew. You are the one that we've been waiting for to fulfill God's promise to the Jewish people. Now, the Jews did not expect that the Messiah was going to be divine any more than they thought that King David was divine, but rather a God anointed and God-blessed leader. This was one of the problems they had, is that Jesus, being himself the Son of God, threw him off. That's one of the reasons the Jews had trouble accepting him. They, did not, they were not expecting a divine Messiah, but rather a leader of the style of David who would defeat their enemies and free them from oppression, particularly in the first century, who would get rid of the Romans. That was a big part of what their expectation was. Okay. So Christ, or Messiah, is a fundamental title that gives us an understanding about the nature of Jesus. A second one, which was critical in the early church, is the title Kyrios, which I mentioned. Kyrios is Greek for Lord, and it was the most common title for Jesus in the early church, the apostolic and immediately post-apostolic age, meaning while the apostles were still around, 
The Lord was the thing that they, they referred to most. Uh, in fact, it's used in Paul 230 times. So in Paul's letters, his 13 letters from Romans to Philemon, Paul uh, refers to Jesus as the Kyrios, the Lord, 230 times. And I, I gave you uh, Romans 10, 9 again. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. So the, the Lordship of Jesus was especially important to in the early church, and even more so as the, um, the Christian faith spread to the Gentiles, because the Gentiles didn't have the, the Messiah expectation. They didn't have, that label didn't mean anything to them. And so, but the idea of Lord is one that they could relate to, and it's one that Paul, who was apostle to the Gentiles, emphasized. Both Jews and Gentiles could pick it up, but it, it's something the Gentiles could accept, whereas Messiah didn't mean a whole lot to them. That had not been something they were looking for, as it was with the Jews. But again, in that Kyrios, there is implied or inherit the idea of deity, of pre-existence, and absolute lordship. That's what the word is, Lord. It meant, you know, you are the patron, you are jefe, you are the one in charge. Okay, so there, there is, as I say, uh, implications of deity, of pre-existence, and lordship in that one title, and especially as we see it used throughout the New Testament, and most especially in, in Paul, and in other writings from that time period as well. And then there's a third that I would, I would mention, which comes along in the Middle Ages, and I just to point out to the bottom here, because you sometimes see reflections of this as you go along a little bit, and that is the idea of Jesus being a friend of sinners. When we get into the Middle Ages, you have people like Anselm of Canterbury, Bernard of Clairvaux, some of the spiritual uh, guides, especially some of the women mystics. Um, um, what's that? Teresa. Uh, Teresa, um, and, and some of the others who come along at that time who, who really were, uh, mystical union with Christ was a major theme. This also sort of followed after the Franciscan model. The idea that Jesus, more so than he is the conqueror, you know, the, or that he is the, the Lord, or he is the one who defeats sin, it takes a turn that, that's much softer and more gentle, that Jesus is the friend of sinners. Um, it, it's from that, without them intending it, it's from that that we sort of ended up getting this gentle Jesus, sweet and mild kind of idea. Because I think most of the people I just mentioned, Anselm, Bernard de Clairvaux, the women mystics, they had they a balanced sense that he was both Lord and Savior and Master and King of the universe, Creator and King, but he also was one who loved us and that we could come to and he would comfort us in that. People who stopped reading Scripture just kept the gentle Jesus sweet and mild because that's nicer. Yeah. Okay. And that's where we sort of get that idea. But this is something that really did come out of the Middle Ages in terms of a perception about the nature of Jesus and his person. Okay? There's three other titles I want to look at that are biblical titles that uh, assist us in understanding the nature and person of Jesus. The first one is that Jesus is the Son of God. I quoted earlier Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. He is both Messiah and he is God's son. Uh, John eleven twenty seven. 27, a woman says, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who has come into the world. Son of God is um, a, a strong statement. Now, it was typical in colleges in the 60s or, you know, a number of years ago before people started, uh, before conservative Christians started getting serious about their academics. Uh, for liberal professors to say, oh, Jesus never claimed he was the Son of God. He said he was the Son of Man. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But he never claimed to be the Son of God. Actually, he did. And especially he did with, because of the reaction that he gave when other people called him that. See, they said, well, <coughs> other people may have called him Son of God, but, you know, he didn't call himself that. Well, we have examples like in Matthew 26 where the high priest, when Jesus is being tried before the Jewish elders, the high priest says to him, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Again, Matthew 26, 63. Jesus says, yes, it is as you say, but I say to all of you in the future, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds in heaven. And the response by the high priest is what? Do you know? 
up. Furious. He tears his robe, which was the reaction that was called for only in one circumstance, and that is blasphemy. So not only did Jesus not uh, correct the high priest when he said, are you the son of God? In fact, in the King James, we sort of get messed up on that because the King James says, well, you have said it. And some people said Jesus wasn't saying, yes, I am. He just said, well, that's you saying that. No, that's not what it means. The translations, the modern translations are much better, which says, it is as you say. And the reaction of the high priest to tear his garment, which was the only time that was called for, was in case of blasphemy. They knew exactly what he was saying. Later on, before Pontius Pilate, Pilate says, um, the Jews insist that we have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. This is John 19, 7. So the Jewish leaders, again, they had a clear sense in which Jesus was claiming to be of the same nature as God. When they said Son of God, that means of God. It means he is of the same nature as God. He shares the characteristics of God in the same way that your sons share your characteristics. Okay. Did I see a hand there? Uh, and then we have Hebrews 1.3 says very clearly, The Son, that is the Son of God, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being. That's what it means to be the Son of God. So, this title, which some people argue Jesus never claimed, he clearly did, because there are a number of circumstances. Um, when, you know, when Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, he doesn't say, no, 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 Peter, shh, that's not right. What does he say? Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for it is not, uh, you have gotten this from God himself, basically. So, the Son of God is one of the titles that gives us an understanding of the nature of Jesus. A second one, which has thrown a lot of people off, I believe, is the Son of Man. We need to understand, and the Son of Man is used in reference to Jesus 88 times in the New Testament. So 88 times he's called the Son of Man. What does that mean? Any Jew who heard Jesus refer to himself or someone else refer to him as the Son of Man would have known very well one of the most popular books in the Jewish Bible was the book of Daniel. Because it was a book about, I mean, there's, there's visions in there, God acting mightily and saving Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the furnace, and Daniel from the lion's den. I mean, why do you think we have all those stories? Because those, these were favorite things with the Jews in that day as well as with us. They knew the book of Daniel very well. Well, the reference to the Son of Man goes back to Daniel 7, when Daniel says, and I had a vision... Um, I'll read it to you, 7, 13, and 14. In my vision, Daniel says, at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days, which is my favorite name for God, the Father, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples in every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. That's what Son of Man means. And the Jews who heard that reference would have known that. Now, there, it, it really has a double meaning. This is one of them. The Son of Man being given everlasting dominion over all the earth is the thing that Jews would have heard in Son of Man. It's also true that there are places where Son of Man simply means a human. Uh, the prophet Ezekiel, 93 times, is called Son of Man. Every time they speak to him, almost, it is Son of Man. Do you, or have you, or will you? So, um, but the fact that it is both of this and it is human, remember, we don't have a problem with the fact that Jesus was human. That's half of his nature. I'm going to talk about our confusions over that, where we ended up. But Son of Man first refers to a vision Daniel had where one like the Son of Man was given all authority. And it also means he was human, which he was. And we don't have difficulty with that. Okay. Questions about any of that? Okay. The third title I want to look at, the Sonship title. These are called the Sonship titles. Son of God, Son of Man, and Son of David. The Son of David is a title that is used for Jesus 17 times. Particularly Jewish, Jewish people, in one case that I quote here, a Canaanite woman, which means she was a Gentile, um, refer to him as the Son of Man. 
We have uh, what does son of, or I'm sorry, son of David? Um, I'll, I'll quote these two passages. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, "Lord, son of David, have mercy on me! My daughter is demon possessed and suffering terribly." That's Matthew 15:22. And then the story of blind Bartimaeus uh, from Mark 10. A blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. The son of David reference goes back to the fact that it was to David the promise was made that he would be the ancestor of of the Redeemer Messiah. The promise is made in 2 Samuel 7, verses 14 and following. To David, uh, because David was loyal and a friend of God, even though he had one very bad scene with Bathsheba, David still is the friend of God, and God promised him, because of his faithfulness, there would always be the promise that the, an heir of David would sit on the throne of Israel and would redeem his people. That's what son of David means, one who is the heir of David. Now, the, the significance of this for the Jewish people is carried out, the promise to David that an heir of his would be the one to sit on the throne. That's why both Matthew and Luke start out very early in their, uh, in their Gospels with genealogies. Matthew, being the Jewish, the most Jewish of all the Gospel writers, his genealogy carries from Jesus back to Abraham. So that it's a way of saying, and it goes right through David. David's right in the middle of it. And it's to identify that Jesus is both Jewish of the line of Abraham and he is a descendant of David. Then Mark, who is writing probably to a Gentile audience, his genealogy goes all the way back to Adam in order to demonstrate the fact that Jesus is representative of the whole human race. But particularly, that genealogy tracks the, the lineage through Mary. Mary was the blood relation, and Mary, too, was a descendant of David. She was of the house of David. You will remember that in the, the Christmas story, it says that Joseph took Mary, who was pregnant with her first child, and went to the city of Bethlehem because they both were of the line of David. So Jesus was descended from David, was a son of David, and rightful heir to the promise that was made to David, both through the, the literal bloodline of his mother Mary, and also, legally, through his adopted father, Joseph. Because in those days, the, you know, there was a, a, the, they would have put more emphasis on the legal legality, Matthew would, of Joseph being his father, even if he was adopted, if he was not his blood relation. Okay? So in both of those ways, they make a point, Matthew and, and Mark, of, um, of Luke, I'm sorry, not Mark, Luke. I've said Mark a couple of times, I meant Luke. Uh, Luke, of saying that Jesus was a son of David through his, his, the bloodline of his mother and through the, the legal line of his adopted father, Joseph. Okay? So, um, again, son of David means you are the heir to the promise to David. I now want to get into, any questions about any of that? The titles, the Christ or Messiah, the, the Kyrios, the Lord, the friend of sinners, and then the sonship title, son of God, son of man, son of David. All of those give us some aspect of an understanding of who Jesus was. I want to talk a little bit now about how, um, in order to talk about how we, what we believe about the person and nature of Jesus in terms of our Christology, I want to start with how we got it wrong so many times, starting with the immediate post-apostolic time. Right after, post-apostolic means the first generation after the last of the apostles had died out. Um, these are called the Christological controversies or heresies. Controversies is because they, they fought about it, they had arguments about it. And the early councils of the church, including the first great council of the church, the Council of Nicaea, from which we get the Nicene Creed, and others that I'm going to mention as we go along, most of the first seven, at least five of the first seven great councils of the church was to resolve an issue over what is the nature and person of Jesus. They were basic, they were sometimes called the Christological councils because they were dealing with the disagreements people had over the nature and person of Christ, the Christological questions, and they were called, the disagreements were called the Christological controversies or heresies. And once they decided what was right, the other side was heresies. 
I want to give you some of those very quickly and then talk about them a little bit. Uh, one of the early ones was called docetism. This said, well, and then it goes back to a very Jewish idea of the nature of God, the immutability of God. They said God, Jesus couldn't really have been God because God cannot suffer. God cannot take on flesh. That would be contradictory to the nature of God. And so docetism said that Jesus could not really have been divine. He was just a really great God, okay? Um, because God could not take on flesh. God could not become incarnate. We then had Ebionism, which said that Jesus was only mortal, was not divine. Similar, but the difference was that they didn't make the argument from um, a, a sort of Jewish-based theological idea. They simply said, by his nature, we don't think that he was God. And um, the Ebionites, they were kind of interesting. And there's still a sect of Ebionites, they call themselves something different now, that exists. They revered Jesus' brother James because he was the head of the Jerusalem council. And they rejected Paul of Tarsus because they considered him an apostate. In other words, they decided what they believed about Jesus. And then they picked and, they pick and choose the things that they accept in scripture in order to support that, which is usually the way it goes. Okay. Um, we then had Gnosticism, which you probably, that's, of all of these, that may be the one you've heard. Gnosticism were the, it was the group that Paul argued against. Paul had two main opponents that he was writing against. One were the legalists or Judaizers who claimed you had to be a, you had to be a, a fulfilled Jew obedient to the law in order to be saved. The other were the Gnostics. The Gnostics uh, it's based upon the word gnosis, which means knowledge in Greek. And they said there was a secret knowledge. Sort of, I always sort of said it's sort of like you have to know the secret handshake in order to be one of the selected or elect. If you didn't have the secret knowledge, if you hadn't been given the secret knowledge, you couldn't be saved. They took a very Greek approach in saying that matter, all physical world, is evil. And so therefore... Uh, they denied the incarnation. They said Jesus could not have been true God and true man. He, and they wanted to believe he was God, so they said he only appeared to be a man. It was sort of a, uh, a ghost. The appearance of Jesus was not physical. It only looked physical. It was a hologram. Okay? <laughs> that he was only divine because God... It, it, this is similar to Docetism, except again, Docetism took sort of a a Jewish high view of the nature of God, whereas Gnosticism took a Greek idea that matter is evil, and so therefore Jesus could not have been divine and human at the same time. They denied the incarnation part of it. That he, he only appeared human, so think hologram. The fourth um, great error, and these, these didn't all happen just ding, 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 one, and one after another, but there were major ones. I'm going to talk about the first four councils of the church in Minden and what they were dealing with. The, the fourth one is adoptionism, which you also may have heard of. The idea there is Jesus was born human, but he was a really good guy. And so at his baptism at the Jordan River with John, God, God made him divine. God adopted him into the divine family at that point. That's why it's called adoptionism. But that up until that time, he was just a human being. So he was not eternal with the co-eternal with the Father. He was not born divine. He was made divine. And some of you... I mentioned this in a sermon um, when I talked about the nature of Christ in one of my sermons. I had a guy who had attended my classes at the church in, in Seattle, and he gave me a ring one day and said, you know, I've got something I want to talk to you about. Could we get together for coffee? So we went to a, lo a local Tully's coffee shop, and he said, you know, I've been studying scripture, and I think I figured it out. Jesus was born by Mary just as a person, as a human being, just like us, but he was a really good man. And so in his baptism, when, when God the Father said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased, that was a declaration that he was making Jesus divine. And this guy was so excited about this. And I said, well, sorry to tell you, that's one of the oldest heresies in the Christian faith. It's called adoptionism. He was so angry at <laughs> I, that, I, that I punched a hole in his balloon. He thought he had figured out the secret of the universe, you know, in the nature of Jesus. Um, but it is one of the very oldest of uh, the heresies that have existed. And various versions of these still exist today in various kinds of uh, pseudo-Christian religious groups or in uh, 
that. For instance, Gnosticism is just, that's, that's the old version of the New Age movement. The idea that, you know, the physical world isn't real and there's something beyond it and, you know, um, so this stuff still, still pops up. Then there was a um, belief called modalism, the idea that God is not a trinity, it's a denial of the trinity, but rather God is only one entity, but that he appears in different modes as Father, Son, or Holy Spirit at various times. Somebody once said, this is sort of like, you know, um, God's playing a football game. And God the Father came in and he played the first uh, half. He sent Jesus in to play the third quarter. And then Jesus came out and he sent the Holy Spirit in the fourth quarter to kick a few field goals to win the game. Okay. No, that's not the Christian doctrine. We believe that the Trinity is three eternally coexistent persons in one deity. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. But that's modalism. And there were, there were a couple of different versions of that. <coughs> Dynamic monarchianism. I really am trying to make this simple for you. Um, because some of these things dealt in huge detail on very minuscule theological differences. But where they ended up, throughout all those arguments, was to offer something that is not what we consider orthodox belief right now. The next one, which is probably the one that gave the early church the most trouble. In fact, this is the one that led to the first council of the church in Nicaea, is Arianism. Arianism says that Jesus was created. He was not co-eternal with the Father. In fact, this is Arius. All of, most of these names, um, like Arius and uh, some of the others I'm going to give you in a minute, um, Arianism, is based upon Arius was a presbyter in, uh, I think it was Melitandria, uh, if I remember correctly, that um, they would be church leaders and they would come forward, they'd start teaching these doctrines because they didn't have all the wonderful books we have, you know. And so sometimes they were making this stuff up. Well, Arius had a statement. He said he believed, with regard to Jesus, there was a time when he was not. Got that? Meaning, Jesus was not co-eternal with the Father. He was created by God the Father. He would have accepted his lordship at that point. But then Arius did other things. You know, he decided what, you know, what parts of scripture he wanted to believe and what part he didn't think was valid and all kinds of stuff. Marcion was another one who did that around the same time. But the idea that Jesus was a created being, not co-eternal with the Father, that one, because of the way the sides lined up on that one, ended up being a huge split uh, in the church. And there were people, even after Arius' death, there were many parts of the church that still maintained Arianism. Um, but, it's, but that one's pretty much gone now, I think. We then have uh, Apollinarianism. This was from the Bishop Apollinarius. And this is where we begin to get into the nature of the, 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 the two natures and uh, person of Christ. Apollinarianism said that Jesus was only a divine spirit, um, that he was not, he had no humanity. Um, let me see what else I want to say about that. That he was divine only, there was no human mind, there was no human free will, that he was only a divine manifestation. Now, Apollinarius was the bishop of Laodicea at that time. So these are major church leaders. Um, Laodicea, one of the seven churches in, in the book of Revelation. Well, the idea that he was only divine, no humanity. So you begin to get the sense. Some of them said he was all human, not really divine. Some of them said he was all divine, he was not really human. All of it is a question of, of how does this divine and human thing fit together? And every possible permutation. The reason we know about this is these were major controversies. If this just been a bunch of guys arguing over a beer, we wouldn't have it in the history books. Okay, these are major controversies the church worked through. The next one is Nestorianism. Um, Nestorius was the bishop of Constantinople, which is one of the major, you know, that's one of the patriarchs, one of the four major centers of Christianity in that day. Uh, Nestorian, the, the, the issue with Nestorian, uh, or Nestorianism, probably was more political than anything because there were a lot of political things going on back then, too. The Nestorius always claimed that he did not say the things he was accused of saying, and that he did not have, uh, he was not a heresy. The bottom line is that Nestorius, this argument started because the church had declared that Mary, that is the Mary, the mother of Jesus, was Theotokos. Theotokos is Greek for God-bearer, that she bore God. She gave birth to God. Well, Nestorius didn't buy that. He believed that 
Jesus uh, was a baby that got born of Mary, so Mary gave birth to Jesus, a person, and that his, he wasn't actually divine at that point. So it was actually, this was partly a Mariology problem, you know, the, the doctrine of the status of Mary. But Nestorius ended up saying that um, there were two natures, there was a divine nature and a human nature, but there was also two persons, a divine person and a human person, and they were sort of melded together, you know, that sort of split personality kind of thing. Um, and he was rejected as being heretical in that regard. Now, he, there are a lot of people, historians, who say he got railroaded, that he wasn't really saying that. But um, we then have, um, and I'm going to go back and talk about these a little bit and where we, to where we end up, but I want to give you a sense of some of the kind of arguments that happen. Um, Eutychianism, um, Eutychius was the, uh, an elder in the church. This declared that Jesus his divine nature and his human nature got melded or mixed together into one hybrid nature that was no longer either one. It wasn't human, it wasn't divine, it was, it was a new version. It was a third kind of person. We then get monophytism, which said that the... Uh, phytism means uh, nature. That monophytism said that Jesus only had one nature because the divine nature had completely swallowed up, completely absorbed the human nature. And only one was left. And then Pelagianism. Pelagianism argued that there was no such thing as original sin, and so therefore, Jesus could not have been the incarnate Savior. He was not our Savior because we didn't need saving. And so he couldn't take sin upon himself, and so it affected the issue of the nature of Christ because it was based upon the idea of no original sin. Now what the heck is this all about, you're wondering? All of it boils down to, was Jesus really divine? Was he really human? And if so, if he was fully divine and fully human, what was his relationship with God the Father? As I mentioned, the first seven councils of the church, at least five of them, this is when they called together people from all over Christendom. The first five of those councils, particularly, are called the Christological councils because they dealt with questions about the nature and person of Christ. All right, the first, the first of the great councils of the church was the Council of Nicaea. The Council of Nicaea, from which we get the Nicene Creed, this was Constantine called this one. You will remember that Christianity prior to Constantine was illegal. It was outlawed in the Roman Empire. Constantine took over the Roman Empire. But his seat was in um, what we know as Constantinople, later became uh, Byzantium, and then Istanbul, which is where it is now. But the Council of Nicaea was called by Constantine because before he fought a battle with Maxinius, the other, his challenger, both of them, they had been sort of half rulers. Diocletian prior to them had split the empire up. Well, they fought each other to try to take over the whole thing. Constantine won the night before the big battle where he was outnumbered and expected to lose. He saw a vision in the heavens of uh, a symbol of Christ. And so he basically said, if I win, against all odds, then that will be my faith. I will believe in this Jesus that I've heard about. He did win. He declared he did not make Christianity the um, religion of the empire, bless you, but he did make it legal to be Christian. But one of the things that he himself declared Christianity, although he was quite political in how he handled it, um, but he, there was a big controversy brewing, and so he called together the first council in Nicaea, which is south of, Const of Constantinople. It's in Asia, what was Asia Minor then? It's current day Turkey. Most of this stuff happened in current day Turkey, which is now 98% Islamic. It was Christian at the time. Okay? That's another talk for another day. Um, so Arius was one of the, uh, as I say, a presbyter in the, um, in, from Alexandria. He had argued that Jesus was not co-eternal with the Father, that he had been created, he was a created being. Constantine calls all the church together to solve this controversy and to establish what is it we all believe, because the church had never all got together in one place to figure this stuff out. So the Council of Nicaea met the town of Nicaea in 325 AD. The point was that they were arguing against Arius, and in that council they established the doctrine of the Trinity, which declared that Jesus was co-eternal, only begotten Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. So the main thing about the, the Council of Nicaea is they established that Jesus was divine, and that they, they established that they articulated the clear doctrine of the Trinity, 
in order to understand how he could have been divine and not have three gods. Okay. We we look at things like the Great Commission, Matthew, you know, going to all the world and uh, baptize people in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and of the Holy in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so there are places the Trinity is clearly indicated, but it never uses those terms. And so it took the Council of Nicaea to clearly articulate. We don't believe Jesus was created. We believe he was divine. And here's how he fits into the whole Godhead. Godhead is the term for the three aspects of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, and have all of you all heard my description of how we were supposed to understand three persons in one God? You know, I, there are a lot of different analogies that have been used over the years. Uh, one of the better ones, I, some of them don't work at all, I don't think. All analogies break down at some point. The analogy of the egg is a pretty good one. You have one egg that has three distinct parts. There is the shell, there is the white, there is the yolk. You can separate them if you want, but they're all three part of one egg. So the idea of having three persons that create that are one God, that's pretty good. But the thing I finally realized one time is that the perfect uh, example or analogy of the nature of the Trinity is, is me, is you, is us. We are made in the image of God. One of the primary ways we are made in the image of God is I have a, a mind which is the controlling side of me part that's supposed to drive everything. I have a spirit, which is the part of me that responds to things that are not cognitive. Loyalty, love, honor, beauty. There is something else going on, some other perceptive and acting part of me that is not cognitive. And then I have a physical body, an incarnation, if you will, incarnate in the flesh. So I, as a human being, have a mind, I have a spirit, I have a body. I have a father, I have a spirit, God the Son. I believe that's one of the key ways that we are made in the image of God. Now, my mind can, can die, and my body still stay alive. Okay? There's an extent to which they are dependent upon one another, but they are also separate entities that can work independently of one another, at least for a time. Okay? I believe all of that is part of our understanding of what the Trinity is. Fair? Question about that? Okay, so the Council of Nicaea really established that. The nature of Jesus as being divine, co-eternal with the Father, which is the part that Arius was having so much heartburn about. Then, the second council, they still continue to argue about it. There were still people who held Arianism even after Arius was dead a number of years later. So about 57 year, 56 years later, they have another council. This is the first council of Constantinople, capital city of uh, Constantine's empire. This was against uh, Apollinarius that I mentioned a moment ago, who was the bishop of Constantinople. He had declared that Jesus was uh, not really human. He didn't have a human mind or human soul. He was entirely divine. Well, they affirmed first what the Council of Nicaea had said, that yes, we believe what the Nicene Creed says. But then they established that Jesus was not only, because most of the emphasis in the Nicaea was the divinity of Jesus. Now they came back and they re reaffirmed that, but they also asserted the humanity of Jesus, that he was fully human, that he had a mind, and a human mind, and a human soul. Then, we're talking about 50 years later, we have the third council of the church, which is called the First Council of Ephesus. This was against Nestorius. Nestorius was the bishop that, is, that said that Jesus had two natures um, and two persons, that they were somehow you know, clumped together but that you couldn't take a human nature and a divine nature and make a human person uh, and make one person out of them. They had to have two persons as well. So, and again, the issue was over the fact that Mary was uh, Theotokos, was Jesus fully divine at the point of his birth? And the Council of Ephesus said he was. Mary was the God bearer. That when she gave birth to Jesus, he was divine already by that point, and that it was not two persons, but one person with two natures: divine nature, human nature. Then we get one of the most important councils with regard to Christology, and in AD 451, 20 years later, the Council of Chalcedon. Count Chalcedon specifically focused on the nature and person of a human and divine Jesus. So they sort of try to solve all the problems that they were still arguing about, because the previous councils had, had not completely put these things to bed. They argued against Eutychus, um, who was a presbyter, and they established that Jesus was both fully divine, 100%, and fully human, 100%. That he was two natures, 
in one person, not some special hybrid. Remember, Eutychus had said that the human nature and the divine nature got together and merged and created a completely new thing. That Jesus was a kind of being that had not existed before, neither fully divine or fully human, a third kind of, of being. Um, and they decided, no, he was fully God, he was fully human, in one person, it was not a new hybrid of some kind. Now, this one, and that doctrine is called hypostatic union. The doctrine of hypostatic union from the Council of Chalcedon. They came out with what's called the, the, the um, Chalcedonian Creed or the Chalcedonian Declaration. We don't often use it in um, churches and stuff, but it's critically important as a piece of doctrine. Um, it, it's less the uh, I believe in God the Father kind of format and much more just a statement of, of what we believe. And this is what it's about. Uh, first, the first part of this, maybe I should have separated it. The hypostatic union is, the definition is first, the belief that Jesus, the divine Son of God, fully took on human nature, yet at the same time remained fully God. That means not 80-20, not 60-40, 100-100. And it was recognized at Chalcedon that it is a mystery. But it is a necessary mystery. Because if Jesus were not fully human, then he could not have fully experienced our humanity and not taken all of our human sin upon himself. And yet if he were not fully God, then he could not have um, acted to atone for our sins fully. Okay? So he had to be fully God and fully human. We're going to take a break for a few minutes. What year was this? Uh, this one is uh, 451. Let's take a break. I, I promise we're going to. Okay. There. There. I'll leave it up on that one, and then we'll talk about hypostatic union when we come back. I realize I'm uh, cranking through material here. Any questions or comments from your reading for this week? And don't say, oh, it was a lot. Is this what we said on Monday? We all know that. I know it's a lot. <laughs> Do the best you can. Uh, any questions or comments? I think so. Well, first, um, Bob first, and then we'll come back up here, and then you, Ron. Well, this is a guy from the Rian Goodens. Pertinent to the discussion tonight. Actually, two things. One is um, medical science, it would seem to me, would argue for, for some sort of a hybrid situation because at least physically. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you're a female, you have to have two X chromosomes. If you're a male, you have to have an X and a Y chromosome. Right. The X chromosome comes from the female. Because the female only has two X chromosomes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so when Jesus was born, to be a male, he would have to have an X and a Y chromosome. Right. You can't get a Y chromosome from Mary. And since she was a virgin, it obviously didn't come from Joseph. So where did the Y chromosome come from? Well, where did it come from? It has to be some sort of supernatural chromosome. The yeah. X chromosome could either come from Mary, or it could be another supernatural chromosome. Right. If you assume that Mary's egg was fertilized in some way, the X chromosome would come from Mary. If the egg was not fertilized, then you have some sort of a supernatural zygote that was implanted by the Holy Spirit. Right. But if you had a supernatural zygote, which had no X chromosome from Mary, he couldn't claim that he was from the line of David. So therefore, he would have to have a human X chromosome from Mary. And this would argue for some Okay, are there any questions from anyone who's not taking a lot? Actually, yeah, and there are people who've, who've worked on this. There are people who've dealt with it. Um, their, their response to it is that the issue of how did he get a Y chromosome, how did it come out of male if it was only Mary, that, that question actually pales in comparison to the whole question as to how did she get pregnant in the first place without, without uh, a husband, without <coughs> male seeds. So, however, the only answer we have, I mean, there is no, I, I can't, uh, I, I know what you're saying, I know that that's all true. I mean, uh, I'm familiar with the fact that men have something that women don't, which is a, a Y chromosome. Um, the only thing we can say is that if God miraculously through the Holy Spirit 
allow her to be pregnant with Jesus, then he dealt with that question along as part of the package. So that's you know that that issue of the white chromosome. Well, it's a question. We don't have an answer to it, and it actually isn't the biggest part of the problem. How does she get pregnant at all? You know, the fact that she bore a male, which requires a white chromosome, is, is kind of a small piece of that. She had a baby without having uh, had a husband or anyone, you know, any male to fertilize her. So, but you know, the the kind of the question you're asking, and I'm glad you asked that. Some people will ask those questions, which is fine and kind of fun and interesting, and causes us to think about things, which I think is great. But then some people will go off on, on that and make that a doctrine of some kind. I mean, I don't know but what they didn't know about X and Y chromosomes, but I don't know if but what some of the people who came up with these wrong Christologies didn't have a similar kind of something going on. Again, they couldn't have used that particular argument. But they find some other reason why it might be um, why the Christology might be different than what the, the Orthodox belief was. Okay? I'll come back to you, but I do need to give a couple of other people a chance. Yes? I thought that in the book, it seemed the writers spent a lot of time talking about the gospel writers as human beings writing human things for human reasons and not necessarily enough time speaking about the, the instruments of the Holy Spirit in directing their writings. Okay, I think I think they do. I mean, uh, Yarbrough and Elwell are both evangelical. I mean, they do believe in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. One of the things you may have been picking up is looking at it as a historical point of view. One of, again, one of the mysteries is that, that the Holy Spirit of God works in and through the personality and style of the individuals. It's not like the, the idea that the Holy Spirit takes over an individual, you know, and, and, and because, and we know that's not true because each of the books has a particular style that is reflective of an individual human being that wrote that. And yet the content, what is communicated, is the part that came from the, uh, from the Holy Spirit. So you may have been picking up on that emphasis, that there is a humanity behind the people who wrote this, but that they did so by inspiration of the Spirit. And I know that you're growing no little not believe that. You know, so. uh, Rob. Just before Dr. Bob uh, made his dissertation, I, I sang him a song, His Tango was Constantinople. It was a good song. But anyway, what I enjoyed... I know that song, actually. Yeah. What I enjoyed towards the end of the reading was that Jesus had the same trouble that the ministers do, trying to preach to people that think they know. Yeah. That was a good point. Well, and this is, and this goes back to what Bob was saying, that this, God wants us to use our brains. He wants us to use our reason. He gave those things to us for, for a purpose. He wants us to use our perception. You know, he gave us five senses in order to use them. It is when we start trying to use those things, especially our rationality, without any sense of humility. When we start thinking that I am the center of the universe. Um, it, it, and it goes back to the Enlightenment to people like, like René Descartes, um, who said, I think, therefore I am. Right? Most famous uh, Cartesian comment. Cartesian, you know, the Cartesian coordinates that you learned in geometry is from Descartes, Cartesian. So he's a mathematician as well. But the idea that I think, therefore I am, at, the, at its root, what that does is it makes my rationality, my ability to perceive and conceive of things, the ultimate thing by which everything else is measured. My very existence is entirely dependent upon my rationality. Okay, is it any wonder with that being sort of found, one of the foundation statements of the Enlightenment, the Enlightenment took us off in a direction where there was no humility anymore? Everything, if my mind can't conceive it, and don't make a mistake between rationality and rationalism. Rationality is good, rationalism is where I think my reason is the only arbiter of what is true and right. And nobody's that smart. And so we, from the Enlightenment on, the reason why we get into all this liberal stuff, they stop having a sense that, you know, could be wrong. I had the cartoon up in... Last week, uh, Snoopy said I had the perfect name for a book of theology. Did it ever occur to you? You might be wrong. <laughs> well, we need to have a sense of that, not to allow that to paralyze us. God wants us to think, and he wants us to write, and he wants us to teach, and he wants us to... But we also always have to have a sense in which, Lord, show me if I'm wrong, because I very well could be sometimes. Okay? Um, and I've told people, if I mess up, tell me. Okay? Here, and then I'm going to come back to you, Bob. I know you've got your breath by now. Yes. Wouldn't before you accept the fact that God created Adam before he created Eve? 
God had the power to do whatever he wanted. Right. Yeah. So therefore we accept this as God's power and character. Yes, that he's able to create Adam before Eve. And he's the one that created the Y chromosome. He can manipulate it as he wants to. Bob, did you have something else? Well, there's the question of the incarnation of Christ. I, I can't really clear up in my own mind. Was Jesus incarnate before the virgin birth? Or was he only incarnate after the virgin birth? And is he incarnate after the ascension? Or is he spirit and incarnate and switches back and forth as he chooses? Right. Well, the definition of incarnation means to put on flesh. Again, as I said before, carne. You Spanish speakers, carne means flesh. It means meat. Chili con carne is chili con meat. Okay? And that's exactly the same root. So the incarnation was where Jesus put on flesh. So the incarnation part occurred at conception. Because as Jesus was forming in the womb of Mary, he already was putting on flesh that could be born as a human child. So he was fully God, co-eternal with the Father, who at the point of conception by the Holy Spirit to Mary, started putting on flesh, putting on meat as a human being, and that was the point of the incarnation. Uh, a wise observation you just made there is people frequently uh, don't think about what's Jesus doing now? I haven't heard from him in a while. What's he doing these days? A lot of people think that at the resurrection, Jesus himself sort of went on vacation and he, you know, when he's ready, he'll come back. But in between, he's not doing anything. No, scripture says that he is at the right hand of God the Father in heaven, that he is interceding on our behalf. Um, he's very much paying attention. He's very much involved. Now, whether or not in his presence in heaven, he still bears a human body, um, I'm inclined to think in some way he does, that he is still incarnate. The reason for that is that John says that when he returns, we do not know what we will become, but we do know that we will be made like him. Well, we're told that we will have a new body, that we will have a perfected body, that I won't need the glasses anymore. I'll still be bald because that's better. But, um, but the idea is that whatever we will be, and the, and the, and the scripture confesses that we don't know exactly, we will be made like him, which suggests like him at the point of resurrection. So the, the suggestion is that he does still maintain uh, a perfected body, but a, but a body nonetheless. And at his resurrection before the ascension, he ate fish. You know, he said to Thomas, you know, stick your fingers in the holes of my hand and your hand in my side. So he did have a physical body. Even though he had the ability to go through walls, there was a physical part of him. Uh, so there is a sense in which he it appears yet, to, yet now to be incarnate in some way. So it's, after the resurrection, was it the perfected body that he had? Well, he still had the wounds. So the suggestion, I believe, is that the perfection of the body will ultimately come at the you know, resurrection. I don't, I don't have a, a, a good answer to that. I don't think there is a, a perfect answer to that in Scripture. Mm. Okay. I've sort of just given you everything I think we know from the Bible about that in that regard. Darlene? The statement you made it concerns me sometimes when it says he will be on the right hand of the Father, mm -hmm. but yet they're all one. Yes. Well, they, the, the imagery of being at the right hand of the Father um, but the throne in heaven. I mean, so much of the images we have. The reason why, for instance, when you get into Revelation or in Ezekiel or elsewhere where they have a vision of heaven, they start trying to describe it and they don't have words. You know, the mind bog it boggles at this. And so they start trying to use, well, it's like chrysolite and opal. And it's look, and it was like, you know, a river and then a sea. And it, because they don't have the words. They don't have the ability to really conceive of and communicate what that is. Well, similarly, we believe that God, the Trinity, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, co-eternal, co-existent as one God in three persons, whether the two persons can sit next to each other or not, I don't know. We believe they both exist. It may very well be that that expression, sitting at the right hand of the Father, simply means He is there present. You know, the Father and the Son and the Spirit are all present together. The Spirit is also present in us since the second chapter of Acts, you know, full time as comforter and encourager and teacher. Um, so there, there are mysteries in that. And that's where part of the humility comes in. You know, when people say, well, I, I don't understand that, so I'm going to have to come up with something to explain it. Mm -hmm. Why do you have to do that? Mm -hmm. Can you not say that there are some things we don't understand? Mm -hmm. I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
I understand enough. <coughs> G.K. Chesterton, one of my heroes, said that if we will allow one thing to be unclear, and that one thing is, is a detailed understanding of the nature of Christ and his salvation for us. He said if we will allow one thing to be unclear, everything will come into focus. But if we try to demand that everything be clear, then nothing is ever in focus. Okay? I, I accept that there are mysteries with regard to the nature of the Godhead, the Trinity, and, of, and some, uh, I know a lot about the person of Jesus, uh, and his, the incarnate Son of God, but there, there are still mysteries in there. I mean, how he could be 100% God and 100% human is a mystery. And the Council of Chalcedon acknowledged that. But they said still, by necessity it is true. That's where, and it's not contradictory. Um, I've talked about this before. A contradiction is where two things um, are against each other. You know, they're saying the same, the opposite side of the same thing. A paradox is where you have two truths, both of which are demonstrably true in some way. I, I gave you earlier the necessity of the full humanity of Jesus and the necessity of the full divinity. We don't understand how they can both be true. But the paradox is that they are. The paradox is a kind of mystery. And the reason is because we reach a point where our mind is unable to conceive fully, and our language is incapable of fully articulating. And that's when we deal with paradoxes and mysteries, and we have to be prepared to accept there are some of those. But don't ever let the things that you don't fully understand or know overwhelm the things you do fully understand. Okay? Because I know enough and am convinced enough and have experienced enough of the truth of God and the, and the veracity, the reliability of truth of Scripture that the things that I'm not absolutely sure about, I'm okay with. I have enough to carry me through at the times what I have to say. I don't, you know, that's a mystery. I don't know. Okay? All right. I want to get back to it a little bit. Uh, any other questions or comments that you're burning before we get back to our content? Do those 11 or so heresies all predate the Council of Nicaea? No. Actually, uh, some of the others came later, and that's why there were multiple councils. For instance, uh, like the Council of Constantinople dealt with Apollinarian, uh, Apollinarianism, and that was, you know, that was uh, what was it, 56 years after okay. Nicaea. So we kept coming up, and sometimes, as I say, there's sort of a rehashing of a previous thing that had been put down, and they had to get back together and make sure that they were clear on this. Uh, but no, that those, some of those, and some of them continue to today. In fact, there were splits in the church, schisms in the church, and there are small fragmented parts of churches. I, I told you, like the Ebionites. There's still a small sect of Ebionites. They call themselves Mara something. Now, I don't even remember what the word is. Um, that, that have existed for 2,000 years. Okay? It, it um, seems to me that not all of them are trying to attack the person of no. Jesus. They're just trying to explain... Yeah, some of them did. Uh, maybe right. three or four of them looked like they were a direct attack on Christ. Correct. But most of them look like they're just trying to explain away mystery, which we've now said, okay, this is mystery. Absolutely, you're absolutely accurate. Did you all get that? Yes. There are a, a few of these. Arianism tried to, to, to deny the uh, co-eternal nature of Jesus. Pelagianism tried to say he's not our Savior because we didn't need Satan in the first place. There are a couple of those <laughs> that really did sort of take on the, the form of um, sort of an angry attack, almost. But many of them were simply somebody trying to figure out how this works. And the reason why the church needed to get together and have councils to talk about it is they had not, they, they hadn't, it's not so much that they hadn't figured it out, maybe, but they certainly hadn't articulated it in a way everybody could agree on. And so the councils were an effort to sort through all this and sift it and come up with the right words to reflect what was believed to be the biblical, the New Testament biblical doctrines that accurately describe the nature of the person of Jesus. But it's absolutely true that a lot of these guys, and in most cases, they didn't, you know, they didn't kill these guys. Some of them were removed from their ecclesiastical positions if they refused to, you know, to step back. Nestorius was exiled, but not, you know, not, he wasn't harmed in some way. There were some of them that they became such a political <coughs> kerfuffle that people were actually killed. All right? So it was pretty nasty. But for the most part, you're right. Most of these things would just somebody, somebody trying to figure it out and, and coming up. The problem was that they would come up with an idea 
And instead of working on it together, they start teaching it or preaching it and start expecting other people to agree with them. And so that's why the church would have to come and go, whoa, 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 whoa. You're the bishop of Laodicea. You've got a whole bunch of churches under you. Uh, and you're teaching something that other bishops and leaders don't think is what scripture is saying. So we've got to deal with it. But it wasn't malicious in most cases. It wasn't malicious. All right? Anything else? All right. So, uh, the hypostatic union, as I said, is the belief that Jesus, the divine Son of God, fully took on human nature, yet at the same time remained fully God. This passage up here is part of the Creed of Chalcedon, or the Declaration of Chalcedon, um, from the Council of Chalcedon. Let me read it to you. It says, the same perfect, it says Jesus Christ the Lord, the same perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man of a reasonable, that means rational, soul and body, consubstantial, which means co-essential, uh, both necessary, with the Father according to the Godhead, and consubstantial with us according to the manhood, in all things like us, without sin, begotten before all ages of the Father according to the Godhead, remember Godhead is the word that means Trinity, it's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together, um, according to the Godhead, uh, and in these latter days, for us and for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, according to the manhood, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures, inconfusedly. I don't think I've ever read a more confusing word than inconfusedly, <laughs> meaning not confused. So, two natures, inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably. The distinction of natures being no means taken away by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved and concurring in one person and one substance, not parted or divided into two persons, but one and the same Son, the only begotten God, the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ. And now you know why we don't vote this one in church. <laughs> but still, critically important doctrine. Bottom line, what it boils down to is Jesus is both fully God, 100%, and fully human, 100%. He has always been God. He wasn't created or adopted or anything else. He wasn't born a human and then became divine later. He was always God. He became human when conceived in Mary. That's back to that issue of when did the incarnation occur. With no mixture or dilution of these two natures forever united in one person. That's what the hypostasis, uh, the, uh, the hypostatic union means. Fully God, fully human, two natures, one person, not confusing or mixing up or inter intermingling or interspingling, as my wife says. Uh, so that that is our doctrine of the, the primarily primary Christological doctrine of the nature of Jesus, divine and human, that came out of Council of Chalcedon. Questions? And, Mark, and during his life and ministry, though he set aside his divinity, and was right. that, he didn't have any special advantages over us. I especially read that the chapter said he went up all night on the mountain and prayed, and he came down and he named the twelve disciples. Yep. He, he got them from God like any other man would get. He, he spent time, whenever Jesus was preparing for either a major decision or a major event, it's especially when he goes off and prays. The passage that you're talking about, and I mentioned it earlier, the kenosis passage, which I'm missing it here, um, which is found in Philippians, second chapter of Philippians. It says, "But Jesus, being himself God, did not take his divinity as something to be grasped, but rather set it aside for our sake in becoming fully human." Now, he still had the power to do things that most people can't do. You know, he still was divine. But he also was fully human, as we said earlier. He hungered, he thirsted, he got tired, he got sleepy, um, he felt compassion, he got angry. He was very human, but still fully divine. That's part of this mystery. If we try to take either one of those things away, either his full humanity, or now, and, and again, the Kenosis passage sort of explains to us what went on there. He was still fully God, but he set some of those things aside in order to be able to be fully human and relate to us. He didn't throw them away, he didn't lose them, he chose, as an act of mercy and grace to us, to set them aside, so that he didn't, you know, so that he did pray to the Father, instead of being, 
know, of one mind with, with God the Father. Well, the disciples, they couldn't cast out demons sometimes, and, and they would go to him, and he'd say, you don't have enough faith. Exactly. Other time, this, this kind comes not out except by prayer. So right. that's what he's getting his power from. Yeah, and in fact, that, that passage, which you're right, we talked about that in our in the class on prayer. The passage actually says this one only comes out by much prayer. The word for prayer there is a particular kind of prayer. It's a, it's a relational kind of prayer, which says, which literally means to involve God. To actually participate with God, to have Him involved with you, not just ask Him to do something or you try to do something, but you and God together in union. To to uh, and it's only by that kind of relationship that that sort of thing works. Okay. Now, um, I had something else I wanted to share with you. Um, let me mention something that Rod came up and asked me about at the break, and that is the, the, the salvation. Or Jesus. We are later on in our class. We are going to have a class on soteriology. In fact, it will be a class on homarchiology and soteriology. Um, homarchiology is the doctrine or the theology of sin. Soteriology, from the Greek word soter, which means to be saved, is uh, salvation. It's a doctrine or theology of salvation. The question is, well, given the nature of Jesus being divine, fully divine and fully human, we talked about the fact that he is he sacrificed himself for us. He had to be fully human in order to be able to experience everything we've experienced. Hebrews says we do not have a great high priest who is not sympathetic with our needs, but rather one who has been tempted in all ways that we are and yet is without sin. So we are not, uh, he had to be fully human to experience that. And yet, he had to be fully God in order to be able to be sufficient in his atonement for us, that we could be saved. So. Our salvation, and I said that when I, the first definition, when we talk about the nature and person of Jesus, and how does that work for our salvation? How is our salvation tied up into this? We'll get into detail about that when we get into the class on soteriology, but Rod asked the question of how does this relate to our belief that salvation comes only in Christ Jesus? It is it is very common, very, very common in churches today that to say, well, Jesus is not the only way to be saved. Well, the compassionate side of me would love to be able to say that's true. That, oh, well, you know, whatever you want to believe, as long as you believe with your whole heart, then you're going to be fine. Well, there are all kinds of problems with that. For one thing, if we believe that Jesus was fully God, who sacrificed himself on the cross, and yet we believe that there's other ways to be made right with God, then why did God himself have to do that if, if it wasn't necessary? You can just be a really nice person and, and get to the same place. Be just as good. You know? it, scripture says very plainly, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. Right? No one. The idea that we can be saved by some other means is not scriptural. It would be nice if it was, because it would make it easier. Now, our response to the rest of the world who do not believe in Jesus Christ and not accept his salvation um, is not one of judgment. Too often it is. Too often in the church it's, well, you know, me and mine, you know, we're saved and you guys are just schlubs. You know, you're going to hell. That's not the Christian response, and there will be judgment for that kind of attitude. Instead, our attitude has to be, we believe that Jesus Christ is the way to salvation. It is the way to find meaning in your life. It is the way to find abundance in your life. And believing that, our response to those who do not and yet know Jesus is not judgment. It's not rejection. It's not to turn our nose up at them, but it's to feel compassion for them. It's to feel concerned for those who have not yet found the one true Redemption that is available in the world, and that is in Jesus Christ. And that's why we share that. That's, that's why I do this. That's why, you know, I preach Jesus from the pulpit. In case you didn't know, I don't get paid for this. <laughs> I do this because this is what Jesus has called me to do, and it's called you to do too. Why? Because salvation is to be found in no other one except Christ Jesus, Scripture says. And our response to people has to be compassion, not water it down so they think they're okay and only find out at the consummation that they're not. Okay? I would like for everybody to be okay. 
unless I am lying to myself or lying to God or lying to you, I cannot say that the Word of God that I believe is the Word of God allows me to believe that. But I don't turn my nose up. Evangelism, best definition ever of evangelism, is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. It is the furthest thing in the world from being proud of the fact that I'm saved and somebody else is that There is no pride to be had in that. Because the, the more I grow in the Lord, the more I'm aware of how dark my soul was that Jesus had to save me from. So how can I be proud, proud of that? Okay? So, it is the nature of Jesus and the fact that he went to the cross on our behalf is what saves us. And we can't suggest that there are other easier alternatives. We can't because of what Scripture said. We also can't because it's irrational to think so. Those of you who went through my new members class, I talked about the fact that people who say, well, whatever you believe, as long as you believe it with your whole heart, then you're going to be fine, is irrational. One of the basic laws of thought, they're called the laws of reason or the laws of thought, the first one is the law of identity, something is what it is. The second one is the law of non-contradiction. Something cannot be both true and not true. Something cannot be both what it is and not what it is. If I say, based upon the testimony of Scripture, that Jesus Christ is the divine Son of God who came to earth and died on our behalf to save us, and someone else says, no, he wasn't, we can't both be right. It is irrational to suppose we are both right. Either the Bible is true in what it tells us, or it is not. I told tell a story in the New Members class of the Dick Cavett show. You remember Dick Cavett? Okay, the, yes. the Dick Cavett talk show? Yes. Um, Jane Fonda, I'm not picking on Jane Fonda, I've actually read that she became a Christian, which is the reason that she and, and uh, Ted Turner didn't stay together, because they couldn't deal with it. That's what I've read. Uh, but she, in her, her wild days, <laughs> back in the 60s, she was on the Dick Cavett show. And the Archbishop of Canterbury was uh, on the Dick Cavett show, back when you could be confirmed that the Archbishop of Canterbury really knew Jesus. And Jane Fonda said to the Archbishop, well, Jesus may be the Son of God to you, Archbishop, but he's not to me. And the Archbishop very wisely simply said, well, either he is or he isn't. You cannot believe it if you don't want to, and you have that right. We're a pluralistic society. Everybody has a right to believe what they want. But it is irrational, it is nonsensical to suggest that two people who say the opposite thing about the nature of Jesus are both right. One of us is going to end up being wrong. And so likewise, it is, it is neither compassionate nor is it rational for me to say, well, whatever you believe, as long as you believe with your whole heart, you're going to be fine. Bottom line is, that means I don't care about you. And the truth that I believe in, that salvation is to be found in one only, <coughs> Jesus the Christ. Okay? You've had your sermon for it. <laughs> but, Rod, I hope I addressed that, okay? And we are uncompromising in that in our beliefs. But, again, the place that takes us is to acts of compassion and concern and prayer for others, not self-righteous indignation that there are all these other people out there that aren't like us. Okay? All right. Um, I want to read you one last thing before we're, we're done for the day, and it's a, a little mini essay that came from a tract called The Incomparable Christ. Before I do, questions about any of the things we talked about today. Um, oops, that's my last. Yeah. Yes. What did ethos mean again? What's that? Ethos? 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 Um, how did I use it? I mean, you said expecting God to fulfill his promise. Sorry, it's been a while. Ethos. Mm -hmm. Ethos means the, the motivation behind something, or what you know, what, what it's at its core. Okay. Um, I'm not sure how I use it in this class. Anybody else remember? Huh. I'll think about it, see if I can remember that. I don't remember having used it, but um, when you talk about the ethos of a culture, it's the thing that's, that drives them, the thing that is sort of their reason for being, raison d'etre, I would say. That's the ethos. Okay. The, the, the push behind things. It was probably because it was after you spoke about Christ as Messiah, Father, Redeemer, and King, so maybe with the Jews. Okay, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Anything else about this? I want to finish today by reading you something that has that's called the incom Incomparable Christ. It's from a tract from the Faith, Prayer, and Tract League. Um, and just listen, I have to take notes. 
He came from the throne of the Father to the womb of a woman. He put on humanity that we might put on divinity. He became son of man that we might become sons of God. He was born in a supernatural way, lived in poverty, and was reared in obscurity. He had neither wealth nor influence, yet the wisdom of men has never matched his wisdom. Never has a man spoken like this man. His family was inconspicuous and uninfluential. In infancy, he startled a king. As a boy, he stunned theologians with his knowledge and wisdom, for he was taught of God. In manhood, he ruled the elements and quieted the raging sea. He healed the multitudes without medicine and fed thousands from a boy's lunch. Even demons obeyed him, and he gave back life to those who died. He never wrote a book, yet none of the libraries of the world can contain the books that have been written about him. He never wrote a song, yet he has furnished the theme of more songs than all songwriters combined. He never founded a college, yet all the colleges together cannot boast of as many students as he has. He never marshaled an army, yet no leader has ever had more volunteers. Great men have come and gone, yet he lives still. Herod could not kill him. Satan could not tempt him to sin. Death could not destroy him. The grave could not hold him. He laid aside his purple robe for a peasant's gown. He was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. He slept in another's manger. He rode on another's donkey. He was buried in another's grave. He conquered death and rose on the third day as he said he would. He ascended into heaven and is now at the right hand of the throne of God. One day he will return with power and great glory to judge the world when every knee shall bow to him and every tongue shall confess him as Lord. His friends gladly, but enemies seeking for a place to hide from his face, he is a perfect one, the only one who can satisfy the soul. He gives everlasting life to those who love him. He is altogether lovely, but best of all, he is my Savior. I wanted to finish with that because for all of my conviction, you know, this is a graduate level course, as we've said before. For all of my conviction that we need to use our brains, we need to understand the history, we need to think about these things, ultimately it comes back to He is my Savior. The fundamental premise of all of our theology is the confession Jesus is Lord. Um, one of my professors in seminary, Paul K. Jewett. Dr. Jewell was a great man of God. He wrote at least one book, maybe more, that, that evangelicals took exception to. Because he was an honest guy. He was, he was sincere and struggling with some of, the, some of the difficult parts of Scripture. He wrote a book called Man is Male and Female, where he was trying to deal with some of what Paul wrote and all that kind of stuff. Um, and yet he did it. I knew him. I had, you know, he was, I probably had more classes from him than any other teacher in, in seminary, because systematic theology, which is the Christian version of philosophical theology, those are my fields of study. And so I had every class he offered. One of the things that he said, which is one of the most honorable and honest and humble things, and he was a great scholar, he was a brilliant man. He started his classes every time, by, well, we started every class with a song. We sang a hymn. Because he always quoted Charles Williams, who, uh, or Charles um, uh, Wesley. Charles Wesley is the one who wrote the hymns. His brother John was the one who started Methodism, the lead that in, in the, the ordained bishops and stuff. Charles um, Wesley always said to his brother, you know, John, you can ordain as many bishops as you want as long as I write the music. Because Charles Wesley knew that the music touches the heart. And so we started every systematic theology class with a hymn. And every course that I had for him, Paul K. Jewett would say, all right, I want to tell you all something. We are here to study and to think and to work through these issues. But if I ever say, or it ever comes out of a class, something that you feel causes you to be shaken in your faith in any way, to question that He is my Savior, that Jesus is Lord, then don't listen to me. Because this is important, but it's not as important as your fundamental foundation in Jesus, who is your Lord and Savior. So go with that if you feel like you're being called in two different directions. And that's why I wanted to read this. Is this is what we're all about. But we still have to think. There, there are too many ignorant Christians out there. I'm not saying stupid, but ignorant people that have simply not studied. And we have no response to the world. Yeah. Second Peter, it says, be always prepared to give an explanation for the hope that is in you. But do so with gentleness and humility. Okay? So that's what we're about. Any last questions?
Yes. Where can we find this? Um, it's I actually got it from an article that David Hawking had online. You could probably go online and look for it and find it. I'm guessing it's called The Incomparable Christ. And it was published in a tract by the Faith, Prayer, and Tract League. That's the name of the organization. Faith, Prayer, and Tract League. My guess is if you search for that, you probably find it. Mm -hmm. One more time. The Incomparable Christ by the Faith, Prayer, and Tract League. God bless you all. Uh, again, does anybody have a problem with the last week of next month? We meet on Wednesday and Thursday in order to make up for me being not a week. You all okay with that? Okay, I'll send out a message to make sure everybody's aware of this.